Ignatius of Loyola has become known around the world as the leader of the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits. His life underwent a dramatic change from a soldier on the front lines of battle to a Catholic monk volunteering at a hospital. His life would continue to change as he went to school, developed a close group of friends, and eventually created a monastic order that would go on to spread around the globe. Stay tuned as we look at the life and works of Ignatius of Loyola and how his legacy led to him becoming an official saint of the Christian faith. Ignatius of Loyola was born in Nigo Lopez de Onaz y Loyola on October 23, 1491, to Father Don Beltran Abinaz de Onaz y Loyola and Mother Doña Maria Señez de Licona y Bolda. He was the youngest of 13 children, with his mother passing away shortly after he was born. His parents were minor nobility from the clan of Loyola. He spent some time away from the family home after his mother passed away, but at age seven, he returned to Casa Loyola where his brother and his wife took over the house. He was baptized in Nigo in honor of Saint Inigo of Ona, the Benedictine abbot of San Salvador. Although he spent much of his life as Inigo, later, when he studied Latin, he would start to become known as Ignatius, and seeing as that is the name he was most remembered by, the Latinized version is what I will be referring to him as for the remainder of this video. A few years later, Ignatius became an attendant for a relative, Juan Velasquez de Cuella, the treasurer of Castile. This move allowed him to live an upper-class lifestyle with Juan. He began partaking in the classic activities for a young boy, like fencing, gambling, dancing, dueling, and the pursuits of young ladies. One of the things that shaped Ignatius' development is the romantic tales of chivalry made popular in the Middle Ages. Because of this, at age 17, he first joined the army. There are stories about his actions during this time, but most of which were speculation. But to summarize, it seemed that Ignatius tried to replicate the tales of chivalry he had read and was quick to attack, easy to anger, and maybe a little too violent. Still, his status and wealth meant nothing ever came of his actions. But a year later, at 18, he took a more official role when he took up arms for Antoni Marique de Lara, the second Duke of Najara. He quickly made himself very useful to the Duke and became a court servant, handling diplomacy and leadership roles for the group. Over the next 12 years, Ignatius continued to serve the Duke, handling diplomatic situations and fighting in many battles without being injured. This all changed on May 20th, 1521 at the Battle of Pamplona, when he was gravely injured in battle. A French expedition stormed the fortress of Pamplona, and a cannonball ricocheted off a nearby wall and destroyed his right leg. This wound completely took Ignatius out of the battle, and he was forced back to his family's castle in Loyola to recover. He would have to undergo several operations to repair his leg, a reminder that all of this was done before modern anesthetics. So as they broke and set and rebroke and reset his bones, he had to endure the whole level of pain. After many procedures, he would finally recover, although his right leg would be shorter and would cause him to limp for the rest of his life. It should go without saying, but unfortunately for Ignatius, this injury meant he could never continue his military career. But it seemed that while recovering, a significant shift in his thinking would also solidify that his path forward would be forever changed. While recovering, he had to spend countless hours and days simply sitting around and healing. He originally wanted the tales of knights and chivalry he coveted growing up. Alas, they were not available to them in the castle. However, his sister-in-law, Magdalena de Arosa, began to bring him books written about the life of Christ and the saints of the past. These stories seemed to spark a fire in Ignatius that would lead him to a path that would pursue the types of lifestyles he read in these new books. But what solidified this more than anything was his dream or vision one night where the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus appeared to him. With this new path solidifying his decision, he left the castle and headed to a Benedictine monastery in March 1522. He arrived at Santa Maria de Montserrat, where he officially began the path of the monks, giving up his fine clothes to the poor and taking his sackcloth garment for himself. 
To finalize his new life, he presented his weapons at the altar of the Virgin to symbolize his devotion to the monk's life. He first began by doing a deep examination of himself in his past life and began to confess all of his previous bad actions fully. He then settled in Maressa, Catalonia, begging to make ends meet. Shortly after moving there, he began doing chores around the local hospital in exchange for food and lodging. When not volunteering here, he began practicing rigorous asceticism, praying for hours in a cave nearby. After a year, in September 1523, Ignatius made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Although he planned on staying indefinitely, Upon arrival, the Franciscans saw something more in Ignatius and convinced him to go back to Barcelona and focus on education rather than staying indefinitely. Because of this, he headed back to Barcelona only three weeks later. He started his studies by attending a free public grammar school in preparation for joining university. After three years of studies, he attended the University of Alcala where he focused on theology and Latin from 1526 to 1527. It wasn't always a nice and smooth time. He encountered the tribunal of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, which forced him into uncomfortable positions as he studied for his degree. He was also introduced to a growing mystical side of Catholicism that seemed to find a place with many during the later Catholic Reformation. But he eventually made his way to France. He began attending an ascetic university called College de Montague, finally moving to the College of Sainte Barbe to attain his master's degree. He would build a deep relationship with six others who would also form the foundation of the next major move in Ignatius' life. His six companions were Alfonso Salmeron, Diego Lanes, Nicolas Babadilla, Samaro Rodriguez, Francis Xavier, and Peter Faber. In 1539, alongside Peter Faber and Francis Xavier, Ignatius officially formed the Order of the Society of Jesus, which Pope Paul III ordained. Ignatius became the first superior general and was bestowed the title Father General by the Jesuits. This title was the accumulation of all of his studies and theological developments. It became a great practical response for the Catholic Church in light of the Protestant Reformation. In his words to Francis Xavier, Ignatius wrote, Ete efflamate omni, meaning go, set the world on fire. This group sought to put into practice once again the traditional monastic vows of obedience, chastity, and poverty, but with the addition of the absolute allegiance to the Pope. Although the Pope has always been the head of the Catholic Church, when many were critiquing the Catholic hierarchy, it was bold for the Jesuits to add the statement to their vows. Over the next several years, Ignatius would write two of the most influential writings for the Jesuit order, Spiritual Exercises and Constitutions. Both of these exemplify why Ignatius and his mates were so persistent about putting the ideas they had been developing for years into practice. With the creation of the new order, they were authorized to approach the mission field how they saw fit. This new way of approaching the mission is really exemplified in the Constitutions. They believed that there were core ideas in the ancient rites of the monastic orders that could be updated to become helpful to all Christians no matter their situation. Unlike others who regulated the spiritual and theological developments to the monks who locked themselves away from society, the Jesuits believed every Christian should individually work on their own spiritual and theological development. Combining these ideas, you see in the spiritual exercises the discerning of the good and evil spirits that vie for individuals' attention every day. This way of looking at the spiritual world meant that no matter what profession, society, class, or homeland, every Christian can work to choose good over evil in their daily lives. The term admorium de glorium, meaning for the greater glory of God, became a phrase to encapsulate the idea that any follower of Christ can choose to step closer to God's glory in every situation they find themselves in. Quickly, the movement started making major strides in society. They started founding schools throughout Europe, began sending missionaries across the globe to evangelize them, and tried to combat the growing form of Protestantism that began to creep up. They spread around the world with zeal, taking up residence in modern-day Paraguay, Japan, Ontario, Ethiopia, and India. It was seen as a clear successor story. 
and Ignatius quickly became known as the leader of the group and started traveling, speaking, and growing the footprint of the Jesuit order. The Society of Jesus grew exponentially over the first 16 years as an official organization, with a large part due to the work of Ignatius. But in 1556, Ignatius began to fall ill with many different health concerns. It was on July 31st, 1556 that he finally succumbed to his illness and passed away. It isn't precisely clear what officially caused the death of Ignatius. His autopsy showed he had numerous kidney and bladder stones of all shapes and colors, which clearly caused excruciating pain, but didn't seem to be his final cause of death. Regardless of the reason, just a day later, on August 1st, he was dressed in his priestly robes and placed in a wooden coffin in the crypt Maria de la Strada Church. Ignatius' legacy was already cemented in the history books by the time he passed away. In 1556, there were Jesuits in a number of different countries and already a network of 74 operating colleges. The growth didn't slow down either. Today, members serve in 112 nations on six continents, running 322 secondary schools and 172 colleges and universities worldwide. It's safe to say that Ignatius' impact can be seen all across the world in all areas of life. It is no shock that only 66 years after his death, he was canonized as a saint in the Catholic Church. However, his impact has reached far beyond the Catholic Church, with his teachings being adopted by numerous Christian denominations and orders until this day. Today, it would not be surprising to see Christians from many different denominations going to a Jesuit monastery several times a year to partake in the spiritual exercises Ignatius wrote over 450 years ago. To cap the ever-growing movement of the Society of Jesus, in 2013, Pope Francis became the first Pope ever from the Jesuit order. But that is it for this video. If you found Ignatius' life interesting, check out some of the links at the bottom of the description to explore more about the Jesuits' history. But for now, why don't you check out this video where we look at the life of St. Benedict of Nursia and see how he helped start another famous Catholic group, that of the Benedictine Order.